Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Lunch and Learn. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm particularly happy to be here with Kirsten of My Dragonfly Gardens. How you doing, Kirsten? I'm doing great. Uh, hi everybody, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn. Yes. So we filmed this Saturday morning. It was really hot, so um, there's maybe a little Blair Witch Project um, vibe to some of the footage, but I tried to keep it steady, and I hope you enjoy. We worked really hard on this, so. Without further yes, ado, enjoy. If anybody has questions, please shoot them to us and I will be happy to try and answer as much as I can. Yes, yeah, so we'll be right here. I'll be talking to Kirsten during the video. So you put questions in the chat as soon as they come to you or ideas, you know, we're, we'll see them. Well, I'll see them and then me and Kirsten will talk about them. So, all right, starting now. Oh, we have a, a visitor coming to visit. She's laying eggs on the wild lime. Look at that. Ah, oh, cool! And I don't have my phone on me. Of course not! Why would I have my phone on me? Hi, I'm Kirsten from My Dragonfly Gardens and I'm here today to tell you about pollinators in a pot. It's something that even no matter what size garden you have, whether you have a small garden or a large garden, you can always create a pollinator pot. You can grow something in shade, in sun, depends what kind of conditions you have. I'm going to show you today how easy it is to plant up with these lovely pots that we have out here so that you can see what is a good way and what good plant selections to try and create a pollinator in a pot. The cool thing with pollinators in a pot is you can use perennials that will last for years. It's not as if you have to change them out every year because they're not annuals. We have a different selection of plants um, and some of the plants that I will be using today, um, I'm going to plant up um, some pots, big pots, small pots. Um, I'm going to give you some ideas of how to put pollinators into trailing, uh, trailing pollinators so they can hang down and look great in a pot. There are also options of using aquatics. Um, a lot of people are scared to use aquatics because they think, well, there's no way we can do that in a garden. But yes, you can by putting it in a pot that doesn't have a hole. That way you can incorporate things like aquatic milkweed, um, different um, pickleweed and things like that, that the hummingbirds will use and the pollinators will use. So the, there are a lot of different options. It just takes a little bit of imagination to create your pollinator in a pot. Today I'm going to do a combination of a sun pot and a shade pot um, for the two main pots, the two large pots that you see here. One of the, the sun pots is going to contain a rosin flower, which is Sylphia masteriscus. Rosin flower is one of my standard go-tos for most things because it flowers for literally 12 months of the year. The pollinators love it and each flower stays open for a long time. It is very drought tolerant as well, so for Florida that's great, and especially in a pot. Um, mixed with the rosin flower, I am most probably going to put some uh, swamp twin flower. Now that sounds kind of crazy, but those two do actually work really well in a combination. Um, and then in with that, I will most probably add a um, corky stem passion vine. I like to use between two and three different plants. The reason why I like to add some form of larval host plant into the pots is because you're creating that whole ecosystem. Instead of just having a pollinator, we want to actually add the food source for the caterpillars. So corky stem passion vine, of course, that will help to add for the uh, larval host plant, which is the larval host for our butterfly, the zebra longwing and gulf fritillary. Another reason why I use corky stem as well is the birds really love the berries and they will eat them in the winter time. Actually, they'll eat them throughout the year. Now the corky stem you can put on the trellis panel or you can just let it flow over the side. Swamp twin flower, of course, the other plant that I'll be using in this pot is also a larval host plant for two of our little butterflies. Um, so that is why it's great to use. It is also nice that um, it is evergreen, so it will be there all year round and has little lavender flowers. So that's the one pot, which will be corky stem, passion vine, swamp twin flower and rosin flower. Now that is a sun loving pot, so that will look great in a hot sunny spot. Bear in mind, any pots you always need to water every day. You know, this is Florida and those pots are going to dry out very quickly. Whether um, you had a little irrigation system that you can add ahead to it so that it waters every day or whether you go out with a watering can. Beware, you do have to water them. I'm going to do a moisture loving pot as well, just for some, some fun and some difference. This is a pot that can go in part sun to part shade, uh, part sun to full, sh uh, part sun to full sun. So I'm also going to do a, a pot that needs more moisture. 
I am going to use a new plant to me, which is a prairie coneflower. It does go winter dormant, so it's important to add that within something that will actually stay all year round. And the other plant that I'm going to actually put it with is one of our aquatic milkweeds. Now, aquatic milkweed is really good to use because it does actually grow all year round and does not go dormant. And we are having more and more monarch butterflies that are staying. So it's really important to use that. Um, aquatic milkweed um, will work well with the um, prairie coneflower because when the prairie coneflower, as I say, goes dormant, you'll be able to still see the aquatic milkweed. And I'm also going to use the swamp twinflower in there. That is a combination I want to try and see how they work. I don't see why it shouldn't work because, of course, the tw uh, twin flower stays um, active all year round. So that's another combination that I'm going to try. Then I have a frog fruit that I'm going to actually put on its own in this very tall pot to let it just trail over the side. The tall pot, um, because uh, frog fruit is a trailing plant, it should look really well having that trailing over the side. Of course, frog fruit does go a little bit more dormant in the winter, so it's good to use it for the summertime. Now frog fruit again is a larval host plant, so it's really good to have that as well because of that. Um, then the last pot I'm going to do is a combination um, for a shady spot. It is tropical sage and I'm using white tropical sage. Now white tropical sage is wonderful because it flowers on and off throughout the year. It is a great uh, pollinator plant for our hummingbirds, our butterflies. We had a bumblebee here busy checking it out a few minutes ago. In with that, I'm going to add a lyre leaf sage and then I'm going to use the last twin flower. So that is a combination that will work fine in sun or shade. There are different plants that will flower at different times. Never be scared to try pollinators uh, and different combinations. If it doesn't work, take it out and try something else. That way, at least you can experiment and see. I like to try things and what I do, if it doesn't work, I just go plant it in the garden somewhere and put something else in its place. I have a rosin flower pot that I've had for four years now. Every year the rosin flower comes up, flowers, and then come winter time it goes dormant and I just have the twin flower around the base of it. And it's been working fine. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to do it and how simple it is. Because I work outside, I do wear gloves. Um, you don't have to, some people wear, some wear them, some don't. And what I'm going to do is show you my very simple, easy way to do a pot. I always use um, broken pieces of terracotta for the bottom of a pot. The reason why I keep these, it helps to add the drainage. And usually I put about three or four pieces. Now, bear in mind, if you have a very, very, very heavy, big um, glazed pot, I'd recommend using things like crushed up plastic bottles, anything like that, that will help give you drainage. You have to have drainage. You know, these are natives. They are used to, most of the times, most of the plants like to be draining well. So, of course, you need to make sure you put something that is going to help them drain. These pots all have one hole in the bottom, as you can see. So now I'm going to take my pieces of crock and I'm going to put them over the hole. I've got three pieces here and I'm going to just kind of build a little bit of a pyramid around the base of the pot. And then we have to put in our dirt. Now I am using um, a um, potting mix that is actually sterile. Um, it has a nice mix of sand, organic pieces in it. And um, what we will have to do, of course, is um, eventually add some form of a fertilizer to it. Now, I don't normally add um, anything that is, not, uh, uh, that is not organic. I usually use good old um, garden compost, if you have any of it, if you make your own. Or otherwise, I use an organic um, chicken poop fertilizer. That one for me works great because um, it um, gives the plants a little bit of a boost when they need it. Bear in mind, you are putting things in a pot, so of course they are going to need some form of nutrients down the line. Most of the nursery plants that you get from the native plant nurseries all come with some form of slow-release fertilizer in the bottom of the pot, so you shouldn't have to add too much to begin with. That fertilizer should last for at least six to eight months. So I would say pot these up and leave them for now for the first year, and then next year you most probably need to give them a little bit of nutrients. So what we want to do is put some dirt in the bottom of the pot there. Then I'm going to do, this is our shade pot. So this is the uh, lyre leaf sage. This is a fun plant for me for the shady areas. You find this growing a lot underneath some of our oak trees. It has a very pretty blue flower. And as you can see, it is starting to get its new flower. Now the flowers are blue, are like a pale blue. Um, and what we do is, of course, when you're trying to get a pot, plant out, you want to take it out of the pot. This one's got a nice bit of root growing already. So what we want to do, this is going to be a medium high one. Oh, and of course, I need to put a little bit more dirt. So that's another thing to make sure you add enough dirt around the bottom of the plant. All right. 
Now I want to make sure that I leave at least about half an inch or a little bit more below the rim of the pot so that you've got some place to actually water it. That's the first plant there. Then we're going to add a swamp twin flower to the front. The swamp twin flower, as I say, is a larval host plant. So this is our larval host plant for this pot. It has the little lavender flowers um, and it stays green pretty well all year round. Now, as you can see, this one has a little bit more root going on. And we're going to, this, as I said, squeeze the three plants in here. So we want to get that towards the front. That is our trailing plant. Now, because we've got some gap over there, it's a good idea to add some soil down in the front there. We want to make sure we don't leave any air holes. Plants do need a little bit of oxygen, but they don't need that big of a gap. So there we go. And then I'm going to start putting some around the sides here, leaving enough room at the back to add our tropical sage. And this is a really fun project actually to do with children. If you want to try and get your children involved in the garden, I would highly recommend doing something fun like this because it gives them an idea of handling plants, how to work with the plants and actually using them. And here's the piece de resistance, the white tropical sage. Again, get it out the bottom. Got some nice root going on. Now, of course, these are all perennials, so you don't really need to worry about it. But if you are actually adding some form of a small shrub or anything, make sure there's no circling of the roots. You don't want it to keep going round and round in circles. And if you did have that problem, you need to just either pull the roots away a bit or cut them. So here we are. Let's put that carefully in the back. And the tropical sage is helping to give us some height in this pot at the moment. So now we just add the potting mix around the base. Making sure I get all the gaps filled in. Packing it down so we get it nice and tight. And you see it's starting to take shape already. Spin it around that way and do this side. And the cool thing with these plants is you will have a lot of flowering pretty well throughout the year. The tropical sage flowers on and off throughout the whole of the summer and it will give you some color in the autumn and the winter. The lyre leaf sage flowers in the spring and in the summertime, uh, sorry, the spring and in the autumn time. And then of course the swamp twin flower flowers pretty well on and off throughout the year. And voila, our first pot. Now, of course, this ground, th this potting soil is wet at the moment, but don't forget, you always need to water anything that you're potting up. Give it a nice soaking through and wait, keep watering it till the water runs out the bottom, then you know you've given it a nice soaking. This pot we're going to use for the aquatic mix. Now, of course, because this needs to be kept wet all the time, I would recommend taking a plant saucer underneath and putting a layer of about two inches of gravel in the bottom of the plant saucer. And what you need to do is maintain a moisture level in there so that the plant, the pot does not dry out. And I can show you what I mean by that. All right, quick question. Do I have black eyes again? No, no? okay, good. All right, so next pot, we need our pieces of crock again. Three, I always use, usually use three, just, and I also, if you see, these pieces are not flat. So this way you're giving it some air and space underneath. Again, we stack them around the hole. So we've got that going on. Now let's put in a little bit of dirt. Now this pot, of course, isn't smaller than the last one. So we are going to have to knock some of the soil off to get those three plants in here. The other option, of course, is you can use a four inch uh, swamp twin flower. So sometimes when you want to use a narrower or smaller pot, a one inch gallon, uh, sorry, one gallon is too big. So the best thing would be is to go for a little four inch instead. This is the four inch swamp twin flower. And what we're adding to the rest of these is our aquatic mix. So this is the prairie cone flower. As you can see, there's some rooting coming out the bottom there. So what I would usually recommend is actually cut it off or remove it if it doesn't come off, come out of the pot. So let's try and see if it'll come out. And that's coming out fine. So that's not a problem. Now, we were talking about earlier if anything was root bound or anything like that. This is not really root bound, but I am going to show you what you need to do if you want to open it up a little bit. 
you can kind of loosen the roots away a little bit like that. That way it just gives the plant a chance to actually kind of grow new roots. And I'm actually going to break that apart a little bit. Let's take a little bit of that matting out. It won't hurt the plant. And that way it'll give it a chance to grow some new roots. Now I need to put a little bit more soil in there because of course, well, yeah, a tiny bit more. This is the tallest out of the three plants we're putting in here. So of course that's gonna to go towards the back. And get that in. Then we have the aquatic milkweed or white milkweed, snowy milkweed, whichever you want to call it. This one actually has been munched on a couple of times, as you can see. Um, I don't think we have any caterpillars at the moment, but there are a couple of seed pods. Um, these have been absolutely phenomenal this summer. They've really grown well. So this is our aquatic milkweed. As you can see, this has not been in a pot for very long. So what's happened now, and you will have this happen to you occasionally, so don't freak out if it does. It's just one of those things. Sometimes the plants have not had enough time to actually establish in the pot. So what we want to do is get that in there, and now the plant is loose in the soil. So I really need to pack around it to make sure it doesn't move, and it has enough soil to contain the plant. Again, this is a smaller pot, so of course we're really packing them in here. Now, let's spin it around. We've got a bit of a gap on the other side still in the prairie coneflower, so I want to compact that in. And then lastly, we're gonna add our four inch swamp twin flower. Oop, see, also falling apart. Not to worry though. It's got some nice healthy com growth coming underneath. Again, we're making sure we put soil around them. Now be careful, gentle when you're handling the plants. Of course, you don't want to grab them or pull them too tight because they are, they are fragile and they will break if you don't handle them with some care. All right. Make sure all the soil is compacted around the base. And voila, our moisture or aquatic pond uh, pot moist or aquatic pot that's the second one the last one we're going to do is the big beast over here now this one is for our sun loving and the reason why i picked this one it's nice and wide open so it'll give our plants a nice amount of room to grow the reason i also use this one is we can put the corky stem, if we fancied putting a little trellis panel or something behind it, we can use that to put at the back. And here is our corky stem passion vine. So again, it's our larval host plant for our state butterfly, which is the zebra longwing and also the gulf fritillary. And a fun fact I learned recently is that the zebra longwing actually lives for six months. So that's pretty cool. All right. Again, pieces of crock. Now this one is uh, one that needs to drain well because these plants all like their um, dry feet. So you can also use um, pieces of pebble and things like that at the bottom. Uh, whatever you have on hand, as long as it gives the pot some form of draining. So we're going to put a few, and I'm actually gonna build this up a little bit more this time to allow a bit more drainage. Again, potting soil in the bottom. I've had people ask me before, should we go out and buy special potting soil for pots like this? You can use some store-bought soil, but I would recommend adding some sand into it just to kind of, you know, you don't want to give these plants too much more, too much nutrients because they're not used to getting that much nutrient. They usually get the, okay. So back to the rosin flower. All right. So, so here is our big pot, this is the rosin flower, and this is the little flower that is on the rosin flower. Now these can get up to about three foot tall. Um, if you deadhead them occasionally, it will make it stay lower. If you don't, it'll just keep getting taller. And as you can see, there are flowers coming from the stem here. And um, that's how the rosin flower works. And it has amazing leaves that feel like sandpaper. Okay, this is our tallest one, so we're going to put that at, this at the back. If I can get it out. 
Oh, we have some rooting going on underneath here. So, as you can see, they're not circling, so that's fine to leave those as they are. So what we're going to do with this one is we put this towards the back. I have already put in some potting soil around the base. Now we're going to add two swamp twin flower at the front of this. If you have a bigger pot and you wanted to, you could actually put the rosin flower in the center and actually put three swamp twin flower around the base. Then that way it gives you a height in the center and you can actually put this pot uh, in any area and you'll be able to turn it around and have the central piece being the rosin flower. This I'm planting up to go into a, a, an area where I can put the back against something so we have the rosin flower at the back. So here is the first swamp twin flower. Again make sure it's set in and it's always advisable after you've put the first two in put some dirt in so that it holds them. And this pot is big so we've got plenty of room. Again, making sure we put enough soil around the back. And then we want the last one for the other side. Again, tip it up, get the pot off. And that one's going to go in the other side here. Wiggle it in and fall around the spaces. Okay. Now we're going to put our last plant in this pot, which is the corky stem passion vine. Again, I, this pot is big enough to put a piece of trellis in the back if you wanted to. So let's grab that out the pot and put it into our last hole. Again, you can use a trellis or you can actually just leave the plant like this and let it trail over the side. It doesn't really matter either way. The caterpillars will find it and the um, butterflies will find it. I mean, sorry, the butterflies will find it to lay their eggs on. Let's add some soil there. Oh, we have a lovely big worm in the pot there. Well, we'll leave him there. That's fine. He'll help aerate the soil. And voila, we have our last plant in our sunny pot. Now again, don't forget, give everything a nice water because they will need it and make sure you water it. I usually water mine. I have a routine of doing them in the morning or in the afternoon once the sun has gone off them. And uh, yes, that's our sunny pot. Now the last one just for fun and because I love frog fruit and I love to use it as a larval host plant pot, we have this lovely tall narrow pot. We're going to put the frog fruit in. As you can see, it's already trailing down. So this is a nice easy one. Again, we need our piece of crock in the bottom. And let's see. This only has one hole in the bottom. So we're just gonna use one piece. And again, this is nicely shaped so it can get the, let the water through underneath on either side. Let's put a couple of handfuls of dirt in the bottom. Now the fun thing with pots, doing pots this way as well, is you can move them around your garden. So if you want to brighten up a darker corner or a shadier corner, you can use the one with the tr tropical sage in it because that's white always looks very good in shade. Now we have our dirt in the bottom. Again, grab the plant out the bottom of the pot, gently put it in. And now this one, of course, I need to wiggle a little bit because I had too much dirt. And as you can see, it's already flowering. Frog fruit again is a great plant because it's a larval host plant as well as a nectar source. And it's a great nectar source for some of our small little Florida native bees. Again, we want to firm around the base of it. Make sure there is no gaps. Push it in. Now this is another pot that most probably wouldn't hurt to have a little saucer underneath and have some moisture in. And voila, we have a trailing pot of uh, frog fruit. Frog fruit, turkey tangle or matchstick plant, whichever you want to call it. So there is a nice easy way to do four pots. Takes you no time at all and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> for your uh, <laughs> cover photo. Okay. <laughs> and if you want, um, I can show you how to do this. So, 
the aquatic plant, we talked about putting it in a saucer to create moisture. This is just a regular plastic garden saucer that I've had in the garden and it will work fine to add some gravel to to put the aquatic pot in or the moisture loving pot. So we put that down. We take some nice fine pea gravel. What we, and that should most probably be plenty. What you want to do is put the pot on top And by making sure you keep moisture in the saucer, it's going to actually keep moisture in the pot so that it does not dry out and keeps your aquatic plants happy and moist. Another idea is also you could use a terracotta one. Now, of course, the terracotta will dry out, so you'd have to put more moisture in them. But what I've found before is I've found these terracotta ones that are actually glazed inside, and you can use that. That won't dry out as much. Same principle, put some gravel in the bottom with it and put the plant on top. And also don't forget, put water sources out for the birds. It's very hot at the moment, so summertime is a great time. Something like this, the insects, uh, the, actually the insects will use and also the birds will use. They'll be able to drink from the bottom of that pot. So that's a nice easy way to create a little bit of an aquatic pot, pollinate a plant in a pot. I hope you've enjoyed this slot. I enjoyed planting these containers for you and um, I have a motto at my dragonfly gardens, plant them they will come. It is so true. As soon as you put these plants in your garden you will be amazed how quickly the pollinators will find them. Um, and we, as I say, plant them they will come. Give us a call or give me a, give me a text me, shoot me an email and I will be happy to help you with anything like that in your garden. Thank you for watching. Bye. All right, everybody, I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. We got one person, at least Anne, enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Thank, and thanks, everybody, for the lively chat. Um, we had some questions in the chat that, Kirsten, do you want to start with the, the soil composition? Sure. So um, potting soil. I know there was a question about what kind of potting soil I use. And um, I've tried different stuff over the years. And to be honest, I either, um, if I am going to use a potting soil from a, a DIY store, I usually try and add at least 30 to 40% of sand to it. Because what you're going to find with some of the potting mixes that you buy, um, they're going to be very rich. And native plants don't necessarily want that very rich content. Um, so if you by adding um, sand into it, it helps to try and break it down a little bit more. The other thing that I've used before is um, if you have a nursery anywhere near you and you can buy their potting soil, um, a lot of the times you can buy an organic, uh, sorry, a sterile potting soil from them because there are no um, nutrients, be, no nutrients have been added. So that's a really good way to do that. Um, what I used uh, to pot my stuff up was um, a nursery potting mix. I use it, like I say, because it's sterile. It contains pieces of wood chip, pieces of bark, some sand. It's a mixture of things. So that way it will slowly break down and it will feed the native plants. Um, if you're going to be leaving them in pots for, for a while, of course, you will have to add some form of nutrient to them later on down the line. And usually if I do that, you know, I usually add um, uh, top dress it with an organic um, chicken fertilizer or something like that. So, but that's not something you're going to need to do for um, the first year or so. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And then the a question from let's see, Julie Becker, she planted native plants and a non-native plant. She planted rudbeckia, fog fruit, and scutellaria, and the snails. The snails ate them all, except for the non-native plant. So do you have any suggestions for snail control or plants that are? So, um... I, I did have a chuckle about that, Julie, and I'm sorry, but, you know, we do actually want to encourage wildlife to eat the plants, not necessarily slugs, of course. Um, I would say the best thing to try and tackle that would be to use plants that have more of a hairy leaf. So things like rosin flower, um, some of the, you know, cut leaf cone flower, if you use that root here, of course, it has a softer leaf. So the slugs are going to go after leaves that are more tender. And I know frog, fog fruit is one of their absolute favorites. So um, try and use, you know, try something with um, different kinds of leaves, like I say, more hairy leaves. The other options, you know, there are some um, other different ways of 
controlling slugs. Uh, Valerie and I talked about, um, I don't know whether anybody knows about the beer cap, putting some beer out. Apparently slugs really like the taste of beer. And then at least it's a humane way, if you want to put it that way, of killing them because they drown in the in the beer. Um, there in, uh, when I lived in Germany, I used to use crust eggshells um, as well that placed around the outside of the plants. They don't like to walk on the eggshells because it's, um, you know, slices them. So depending on where you've got it and how you've got it, that would be the easiest way. But the other way, of course, is um, slugs come out uh, late, late evening, well, evening and early morning. So maybe you can try and see if you can catch them. I know I've never really had much of a problem with slugs. So maybe the pot was just a little too moist or they were very hungry. <laughs> Hope that helps. Thanks. Just lots of kudos in here. Oh, a question by person named Fight, I, I guess, F-I-T-E. Uh, what do you use for mosquito control in the wet saucer? Um, I actually haven't really had any problems yet with mosquito control. You know, the way to actually possibly don't let as much water sit in there. Of course, we've had a lot of rain recently, so there will be water in there. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of frogs here too, and lizards um, and dragonflies. So we, you know, a lot of them take care of that. Um, there are different, let me think, mosquito control. Yeah, depending on how big the saucer is that you use, um, either make sure you put more gravel so there is not a lot of sitting water um, or otherwise um, put it into, uh, I have a, a pond here as well, a galvanized stock tank, and I just have my pots in there. And of course my fish eat all the mosquitoes. So I never have any problems with that. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And uh, we have a question from earlier about um, cutting back stems once they're done flowering and seeding. And so maybe mm -hmm. we could just talk about, you know, pot maintenance. So maintenance, oh sure, you know, and that is half the problem with these, uh, all of those pots that I created, they should last for, you know, a, a good few years because they're all perennials. The, what I would recommend is, you know, obviously like Valerie says, when you, um, tropical sage, let's, let's tackle that one first, salvia coccinea. That one, um, if you deadhead that occasionally, and I mean deadheading by taking out, when you look at the flower spike, you have a central one and then you have two, two shorter spikes that are coming up. If you nip out, and they're square stems, so it's very easy, you nip out the central stem that has finished flowering, that will actually promote more flowering because then the two stems either side of it will come up. Um, all sages are the same. They're all square stems, I think. Uh, I would say 90% of them, I think, as far as I know, are all square. And they're very easy to just nip out with your fingers. The lyre leaf sage, which is in the same pot, that would be the same thing. Now, um, uh, the rosin flower, that one takes to being trimmed. You can deadhead it. Um, same thing again, you will find that the center, center uh, flower will flower out and then you can cut it out right at the base where it joins the other stem. I Sometimes I deadhead uh, rosin flower, sometimes I don't. It's good to leave some of the seeds to drop, of course, because you want to actually create new plants. So I would recommend that um, deadhead them, um, you know, leave. My, my rule of thumb is deadhead a third, leave a third on the plant to mature, and then, of course, leave a third for uh, to fall on the ground. So that kind of, you know, you are recreating or allowing the plants to regrow. Um, the other stuff you'll find the swamp twin flower, and I've used that in a lot of the pots purely because I know it is a great larval host, a lot, sorry, larval host plant, and also a nectar source, and it's a nectar source for our smaller butterflies. Now, swamp twin flower will do fine over the winter, but what you might find is come January, February time, you might want to trim it back so that it refreshes and you have a whole new growth. And it does trail over the sides of the pots really beautifully, so that's another reason why I like it. Um, the swamp twin flower, um, as well of being evergreen, of course, it flowers all the time. So you will always have some form of color on that. And then uh, let me see what else have we got. Of course, the aquatic milkweed. Um, that one is one of our very few native milkweeds that actually, and this is Rodney, sorry, he's come to say hello. <laughs> um, the aquatic milkweed is one of our very few aquatic uh, or very few natives that actually flowers all, I mean, sorry, is has green leaves all year round. So it's really important because we are getting more and more uh, monarch butterflies that are staying here all year round. So it's great to have that because you will get caterpillars that will be using it all year round. Um, the, let me see, corky stem, of course, that's a larval host plant and that is one that um, doesn't really need much of anything of course if it dies back from the dead part back and it will come back from the ground in the spring 
Um, and then let me see, what was the other stuff? I think that's pretty well it. So hopefully that gives you some idea. Oh, one thing I didn't mention about the rosin flower, that is one that will flower pretty well all throughout the year. What you will find the rosin flower when it gets to a point where it is not flowering much on the stem and it will get to um, anything from three, I've seen some of them at five foot tall, believe it or not this summer. But if they get tall and they start to get leggy, you might find, or you will find that there is new growth that comes from the bottom. And when this happens, you go in and you cut that stem and cut it down to the ground as far as you can. Don't leave an inch or two up because it looks untidy. And it also, you know, it just doesn't give the plant a nice amount of time to regrow. Tropical sage will do the same thing. Once it gets to a certain size, it gets leggy and it'll be nice to be able to cut that back too. I usually recommend leaving them until they start to get the new growth coming from the bottom. So hopefully that answers your questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we did have a question earlier about um, disrupting monarch migration mm -hmm. and the, you know, and having green leaves all year round. So we have taken a position, you know, strongly against tropical milkweed as, you know, oh, yes. a disease vector, as an invasive species. Um, so that is, you know, Florida Native Plant Society is not good. We're not, we're not okay with tropical sage. And the yeah. research on what's happening with the monarch migration and climate change there are recommendations from the Xerxes Society to cut back your um, any milkweed during the winter that is, you know, native milkweed during the winter, you know, to not continue the OE cycle. Um, so, I mean, I think is the jury in, the jury's out. Um, just, I mean, planting native is definitely recommended and maybe we'll see some some stronger guidance come in the future. And that would be really good, you know, because it is a very difficult situation because, um, you know, all the, uh, the big box stores are all selling the tropical milkweed and they're classing it as a native and it drives me crazy. I don't have tropical milkweed. I don't ever plant tropical milk milkweed. I will not use tropical milkweed. Um, the aquatic milkweed that I have in my pond uh, and going back to what you're saying, Valerie, about cutting it back. Yes, I totally agree with that. What you find, or what I find with my tropical milkweed in the, I'm sorry, my uh, swamp uh, aquatic milkweed in the pond, it actually goes through cycles when it totally dies back and then new pieces come up. So um, yes, uh, definitely if you have it in pots, I would say cut it back. It's something that, you know, we definitely need more guidance. And that's a really important thing because there's so many monarchs around in the winter time. So what do you do? So yeah. And, you know, I mean, monarch migration is very complicated. I mean, we have some lunch and learns. Yes. You can watch. Lily did an excellent job in, you know, covering what we do know. And so, you know, to say that we know exactly what's going on is, you know, we'd be filled with hubris <laughs> to say that. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Okay. Yes. And so, you know, we're talking about, obviously, I am in Kissimmee. Kirsten is in Mineola, right? You know, the yes, plants are from, yeah. so the plants are from Central Florida. I know Central Florida. I can, you know, work on stuff throughout the state. We had a, let's see, the Andy Nacarado, 20 weeds for 10, anyways, the, the native weeds for butterflies presentation. That was focused on Southwest Florida. So I do intend to do more regionally focused stuff because I have basically no expertise on landscaping with natives in other areas of Florida. And I, I would like to do more of that, um, but I don't have an answer that someone asked if, you know, could you replace, could you give me suggestions for Southeast Florida? No, I can't, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You know, and that's something um, same here with me. I'm used to central and, you know, slightly North Florida. So I know a lot of the stuff that grows here and grows further North. Uh, and I, you know, it's important. We, we do forget that there are other parts of Florida and we are very different in our climates. You know, we're, we're very temperate here in central Florida. We, we're we're uh, in the area where we can still grow some uh, plants from up North and we are in the area we can grow some plants from down South. But you guys down south have a very different dynamic and a very different way of growing. So, um, yes, that's very important to actually look into that. And uh, I know um, Valerie uh, was looking at some of the stuff. And did we work out that most of this could work down south Florida, except for the rosin flower? Yeah, some percentage of them were, you know, so, yeah. also south Florida. Yeah. 
So that's kind of that's kind of fun. And I apologize. I never even thought about it when I was doing this to think of things for the different parts of Florida. I know when I was doing some research, I did find out that uh, Philo nodiflora actually grows all the way up to Virginia, which is very surprising. So that's kind of cool that it has such a range um, and it's a larval host plant, so it's important. And, you know, have fun with the pots. Don't, you know, try different things. If something doesn't work, hey, take it out, plant it in the ground or put it in a different pot and put something else in. It's fun to experiment. I've done dry pots, I've done wet pots. I took a terracotta pot. Uh, that was given to me that was very a, a very special one from a friend and of course it's terracotta so it dries out uh, but this one was a different kind of terracotta and it seemed to hold the water for longer so what i did was i took some um, horsetail fern and some pickerel weed and um, some of the eryngium uh, aqua, uh, aquacetum i think it is the purple uh, rattlesnake master uh, the aquatic one i think it's Aqua think is a thing. Arrangium. Yeah, it's something aqua. Anyway, I put those three in a pot. Aquaticum. And all I do, aquaticum, that's yep. it. Uh, and what I do with that one is I have rocks on the top of it and I just make sure I keep filling that every now and again with water so that it slowly sleeps. And my pickerel weed is flowering. The horsetail fern looks phenomenal. And of course, the hummingbirds love the pickerel weed. So, you know, play with them, try different things. Don't be scared to try. Oh, I, I missed this question. Can you use coral honeysuckle in hanging pots? You can, um, coral honeysuckle, um, uh, you'd have to put something in front of it because coral honeysuckle does get bare legs once it gets woodier and older. So I would definitely recommend putting something and I would say you could most probably, coral honeysuckle is fairly drought tolerant. So I would put something like, uh, and if you, you'd have to have a big enough pot, of course, because coral honeysuckle really, is going to get some yeah. substantial roots. So yeah. please give it at least 20, 20 inches or more uh, in diameter. I would say more if you can, because you don't want it to get root bound, especially if you want to put something else with it. So with, with that in mind, I would say you can do um, a tropical sage in front of the coral honeysuckle and then um, put some frog fruit, a frog fruit to dangle down in front of it. Try that. Might be kind of fun combination. And then put a piece of trellis behind it to let it grow up it. So that would be a very interesting combination. It might be a bit too big of a pot to maybe use as a hanging pot, though. I mean, you use like a big pot for the coral honeysuckle and then to hang it. Yeah, something. you couldn't hang it. No, no, you couldn't. You'd have to, you know, um, I have actually I have two pots in our back garden. One is a cross vine and the other one is a Carolina jessamine. They have been in pots now for five years. They both flower all the time, but those pots are, they're big. They're, um, gosh, I'm absolutely awful at guessing things. So I'm going to get my ruler out and I'm going to try and work out. I think, yeah, I think they're most probably at least uh, 15 to 20 inches wide and they're tall. So, and then I just top dress them every year with a nice wash of uh, organic um, fertilizer and they're fine. They, I haven't touched them for years in regards to soil or anything and they still work. Awesome. So yes, you could most probably do coral honeysuckle in a big pot on the ground. On the ground, yeah. <laughs> um, do you think I could show off the um, the FNPS plants website? Yes. For people to find. Okay, so I'm just gonna. Sure. Um, people won't be able to see us anymore, but they can still hear us. So. And actually, also while Valerie does that, if anybody, you know, uh, I did take some up to date photos of the pots that we did last weekend. Um, of course, like I said, we've had a lot of rain, so everything is looking great. If anybody wants to see what they look like a week later, um, I would be happy to show you. Okay, yes, let's do that next. So you can't see this. Sorry, Kirsten. Um, That's fine. <laughs> but here's the, the plant list. You, you click um, find plants based on range and habitat needs. And if you're in southeast Florida, um, let's go to, let's say you're in Dade County. Well, maybe it's under Miami-Dade. Miami-Dade. Okay, so Miami-Dade, you don't have to select zones. Um, you want a full sun pot um, and you want caterpillars, right? Because that's what we're doing. Caterpillars, mm -hmm. butterflies, pollinators. How cute is that? And then we can say we want it wet and then you can submit and bam, you got a list of plants. So. And I was saying earlier to Valerie that I, the FNPS, their new website is awesome. Yeah. It really is great for user friendliness and for information. So definitely use it. It's a, it's a great resource out there. Thank you. Yeah. And so you can see here's our, I just pulled up Beach Falls Fox Club that came up and then we have, we link directly to fans website. 
So Fan does not have this one for sale, unfortunately, but um, they do have others for sale. <laughs> uh, should have <laughs> test that, tested that one ahead of time. Oh, well, mm. you know, stuff happens. Oh, I just realized I was in studio mode. Sorry, guys. Oh, oh, I'm going to have to do that again. Uh, okay, so here's the plant. Here's the plant guide. Native plants, native landscape plants for your area. Here's the find a plant based on range and habitat needs. Uh, you can search Dade. Just do this all over again for everyone. Part shade, at least one of my choices. And you get this really nice selection of what your site is going to be like. And in this case, it's not your site, right? It's where do you want to put the pot and how much are you going to water it? <laughs> and then yep. submit. And there you get plants that meet all your all your options and let's click one that's likely to be available and see find this plant at a native nursery and it grows right right to fans website and you can find a nursery near you that works for that and that's something valerie brought up a very valid point uh watering don't forget these plants are in pots they dry out if you use a nursery potting soil that is for natives it dries out very quickly so keep an eye on them. I have to water my pots um, uh, at least once a day, uh, sometimes even you know when it's very hot. Uh, just keep an eye on them. Uh, we actually have in our garden here, because we have so many pots, uh, and I keep adding more, we actually have um, an irrigation system that is on a sprayer, and I, I can just put that into the pot to make sure it gets extra if it needs it. But yes, uh, keep an eye on the water and move the pots around as well. I rearrange my pots, then it, it's like a change in season. It kind of, you can move it to a different area and see how it does. Sometimes they won't do well in one area, but they'll be happy somewhere else. So play with them if you can, if they're not too heavy. <laughs> um, we do have a question, which I do not understand. It okay. says, um, do you use the thrill, fill, spill design? Thrill, fill, spill design. I have no idea what that means. <clears throat> Thrill, fill, spill. In if if I'm interpreting it, I would say that you mean you put them in there, you leave them for a bit and throw them away. No, these are all perennials. They will keep going for years. So no. <laughs> but um, yes, can you elaborate? Uh, whoever yes. asked that question, please, please elaborate. P to it. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know that one. Um. Yes. Oh, Bonnie, our current president, points out something mm -hmm. very nice that we actually have a license plate like that you can put on your car. Yes, yes, you do. And we need you to reserve it. Wow, that's cool. They're selling that fast. Yes. Well, that is it's awesome. just the process. Okay, everybody, because they don't print them until you well, print them, whatever the create them. They don't. Okay put the little cover on the metal <laughs> until we reach a certain number of license plates reserved. So okay. everybody's in the reservation state. state. We need 3,000 of them. So please, fmps.org, and you'll see the little, the little bar there. You can reserve it. And then whenever we hit that mark, hopefully very soon, then you can replace your old grungy license plate with a license plate that supports the Florida Native Plate Society. And of course, it's important to do this because um, part of that money goes to help FNPS. So very important. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Oh, here we go. We got it. <clears throat> okay, so what is it? It means something tall, something that trails, and something that's smaller. Ah, all my pots have that. So thank you. <laughs> I like to always have visual in visual interest by different heights. Um, I'm a designer, so of course, I always have different things. Some of the pots, um, you can put them against a corner or into a, on the side. Some of them you can, you know, if you if you want to create the um, different layers, of course, yeah, you always, I always put something tall in the middle or towards the back and then different layers coming down. So yes, so thank you for clarifying that. That's a very interesting way to do it. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I don't know how I didn't know that. I guess I'm not really in design. Yeah. Anyways. I am, but I've never heard that one before, so. I learned something new. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have another question. Um, how do you handle hurricane prep with all of the container plants? 
<laughs> and I also have a lot of stuff that's from my home, so I have to bring them inside in the winter time. <laughs> um, yes, very good and very valid question. Uh, you want to make sure that you have somewhere that you can actually put your pots. Um, this house, when we have a hurricane or when we have cold, uh, we have a lot of pots inside. So yes, you need some way of being able to move them. The very big pots with the vines in, they've never been moved. Um, like I say, they, they actually have trellis panels that support them. We're using it as a green wall, so I can't move those um, for shade against the house because it's on a west facing wall. But um, definitely, yes, you'd need to be able to move the pots if, you, if you're in, you know, if you have any problems with hurricanes coming, so. That's a very valid point. Yes. Have some way you can move them to. Yeah. This, I mean, as much as we love pollinators and native plants, and this definitely makes your hurricane prep a lot, require a lot <laughs> a more. Lot more. <laughs> it's a lot of squatting. There's, uh -huh. <laughs> there's like a whole day of moving your plants. And I mean, you can put them like up against a wall, you know, like mm -hmm. that you think, I mean, look at the hurricane track and that's what I used to do because I didn't have a big house. Yeah. So I couldn't put them all in the house. They didn't fit, but you could put them up against where the wind would blow them into the wall um, yeah. or maybe a fence in the wall situation. That's what I did. And I only had a couple of dumpers. That's actually, that's a really good way to do it. Just to move them towards the house, wherever you've got a sheltered area, um, you know, or into a garage, somewhere like that. It's not as if it's going to be for weeks. It's usually for a matter of hours or a day or so. So you could easily do that and then take them back out. Of course, you don't want to keep them inside for days no. because they won't be happy. They can't eat. I mean, they can't eat. They can't breathe. So they need the sun. So, yeah. Yeah, this is Definitely. a whole life thing. You are you are creating your life around these native plants in a pot. <laughs> yes, and you're you their slave. <laughs> it's very addicting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there's lizards in your house, you know. Yeah, when I bring the orchids in in the wintertime, yeah, we have lizards and uh, yes, it's fun. <laughs> oh. uh, Rosie Mulholland uh, suggests that if you're going to move big pots, you can buy an ex inexpensive furniture scooter thing from Harbor yes. Freight. True. A, a, a furniture dolly or something. Like, yeah, we have like one, one of those, those things like this. And we have, yep, we have a, a big, um, you know, um, to move uh, other things around. So yes, so there is ways to get around it. So the, the hardest thing actually is finding places to buy pots here. That's what I found. It's really difficult to get inexpensive, um, decent quality pots. So, yeah. It's definitely addicting. I have lots and lots and lots of pots. So, yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> hmm. Valerie, would you like me to share the photos oh, of the stuff yes, now? Yes, please. Let's do that. Um, Okay, so I have to share the screen, correct? Yes. Oops, hold on. And make hold sure to press button. okay. Share. There you go. So this is the um, tropical sage with the lia leaf. And actually you can see towards the bottom, there is a bloom coming with the lia leaf sage. Um, they're doing great. I haven't had to do much except water them so far. So that's the one. Um, then here we, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. That's passion vine, if anybody wants to know. <laughs> Purple passion vine. Uh, then this is the rosin flower one. And actually we have a new bud coming. So that's kind of fun. And the corky stem is doing great. And um, the last one is, oh, I've got another one after this. Of course, that's the frog fruit, fog fruit. And you can see it's already flowering and it seems very happy in there. Um, so that's worked out perfect. And then this is the one that's the aquatic. And actually you could see, um, I have actually got the gravel pretty well, maybe a quarter of an inch from the top. You could actually fill it with gravel all the way to the top and then you won't have as much water sitting there. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't actually had any problems with mosquitoes in that respect yet. So that was the last one. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now all I have to do is try and work out how to get back out of this. So there was a red thing? Oh, yes, over there. I got it. Okay, good. Yeah, so, I mean, thank you for, you know, taking time out of your weekend to let me film you and getting all the plants and everything. <laughs> it was my pleasure. And if anybody has any questions or needs any help, uh, as Valerie said, you know, uh, native plants are fun and um, we want, we need people to plant more pollinators and plant more pots like this. If you have literally a balcony, you can do pollinators. You know, it doesn't take a lot of space. So um, give me a shout if you have any questions. Yes. And Thank I, I just put your email address in there. Um, do you want me to put like your phone number? 
Yep, my phone number, I'm always available. Okay, I will type that in there. I know six. And the people want to know about your bird. <laughs> That's Mr. Rodney. Uh, he's the son, Konya. Uh, he is uh, 16 and a half years old and he thinks he's a person mm -hmm. and he loves to get involved. So, yes. And he enjoys walking around the garden when it's cool and, um, ex uh, well, actually eating some of the berries from the natives. So it's kind of fascinating how he knows what he can eat and what he can't, even though he's not from Florida. So go figure. But yes. <laughs> He is quite a character. <laughs> yeah. So cool. I was doing a presentation for planting for birds and it was a Zoom uh, last year in November uh, for one of the FNPS chapters. And we were talking about birds and lo and behold, up he comes and he sits on my shoulder. And I think he sat on my shoulder most of the presentation. <laughs> so it was quite a funny, <laughs> crazy bird. <laughs> All right. Yep, lots of kudos in the chat. So I, I really, it seems like people enjoyed it. I, worth the effort, I think. Okay, good. <laughs> it was worth the blood, sweat, and tears to do it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Just a lot of sweat. I don't, I didn't bleed. <laughs> a lot of sweat. A lot of sweat. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, I hope you have a great weekend, Kirsten. Thank you. You too, Valerie. And I hope to see you soon and um, have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, keep doing the lunch and learn. It's an awesome thing. Knowledge is key. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone.